For criminal media's policy, I'm Sane Lamini, South African author and a journalist, Liz McGregor, is joining me to discuss a book she wrote about the death of her father titled Unforgiven, Face to Face with My Father's Killer. Your father, Robin McGregor, was a well-known figure who published extensively on ownership patterns in the South African economy. How do you remember his contribution to economic life in the country? Well, my dad, um, you know, he was quite a restless man and he worked in several industries. Um, you know, he was in chickens, he was in sugar, he was in packaging. And each time, you know, he left a job, he realized there was some sort of monster coming up behind and gobbling up the company he'd just been working for. So when he was in his early 50s, he went part-time on his job and he bought up one share in every single company. This was a time when it was all paper. So he had to go and sit in share registry offices and wait for them to, you know, to, to do the paperwork and see him. And then he spread it all out on our dining room table, these bits of paper, added them all up. And he realized that 80% of the country was owned by five companies on the stock exchange. So this was a massive concentration of wealth that happened under apartheid. And this was partly because of sanctions. As the, as the international companies divested, the bigger companies in South Africa bought up all the smaller ones. But the consequences of that was that they were able to set whatever prices they liked. So the poor were hit the hardest, and it was a massive concentration of wealth in a small, small number of hands. So that, had a, that revelation had a big impact, I think. And he was murdered just two days after your family had met to bury your mother's ashes in 2008. As a journalist, why did you decide to write about these personally painful events? You know, we were quite lucky in that someone was actually arrested for the murder um, and he was convicted. You know, that only happens in 11% of, of murders in South Africa. You know, it's a very, very low conviction rate. But the trial itself was um, not only was very traumatic because you sit there, you know, right next to the man for, for two months it went on for, you know, who did this terrible thing. Um, but also you hear all this forensic evidence of exactly how he died and how awful it was. But also during the trial, we learned for the first time of what was behind it. We didn't know before the trial that there was this big gang connection. So you had these sort of gangsters parading through the court. And that was very shocking. So in a way, there was too much to take in. And because Cecil Thomas, the man who was convicted, um, pleaded not guilty, it was never very clear what had actually happened. You know, obviously the state managed to convince the judge that this man was guilty. And I thought it was quite clear he had because they found some of my father's blood on his sock and he was seen in the area. But we never got... A, you know, what, what actually happened in that last hour of his life? Because the Cecil Thomas kept claiming that he'd been set up, that it was a gang murder by the 28's gang. Um, I mean, I'm very shaken by the, the new crime stats that just come out, that in the first three months of this year, there were 6,000 murders and more than 10,000 reported rapes. Um, so I know from personal experience how devastating a murder is when a member of your family goes that brutally. Um, Doug, it's, it's, it's completely destabilizing, apart from the grief. You know, there's shock, fear, your whole world is completely blown apart. And the fact that this has happened to 6,000 families just in the first three months of the year, to me is, you know, it's horrifying. I don't know why there isn't more, you know, more of a fuss made. I mean, this is a war, basically, against by the brutal against the vulnerable, you know, and particularly women and children. Even though we had a trial and we were lucky to have a trial, it was very traumatic. And I felt we didn't get many answers. I still had no idea what happened to my father and why. So, I mean, it took a long time for me to be able to, to get to have the strength and, the, and to be fired up with the adrenaline you needed to do it. But eventually in 2017, I was knocked down by a car and um, quite badly injured. And um, I think the shock that that gave me took me back to the shock I'd had, the sort of sense of imminent danger, of danger being everywhere that I'd had during the trial and my father's murder. And it gave me the adrenaline to 
do what I've been feeling I had to do for a long time, which is to find out the truth about my father's murder, why he died, um, you know, the gang involvement, what it meant about our country. I just needed to find out more as a journalist and also as a daughter. I felt I owed him that. So it was a difficult journey. Um, I thought it would be quite easy. I thought I'd just go to the prison and say, you know, I want to see this man. Um, but I did that. I found out what prison he was on, in. It was Fuerbach in uh, prison in the Western Cape. And they told me the only way I could do it was through a victim offender dialogue. I said, that's fine. And they were very happy to see me. They said, look, you know, we're always trying to do this. And if we've always got to track down the victims. It's always difficult to persuade them to take part. And here you just turn up. And then after that, they just effectively ghosted me. I just couldn't get hold of them. I mean, it was all talk and no action. This was very difficult to deal with, you know, having sort of, you know, sucked myself up to do this and then suddenly just it not happening, waiting week after week for the phone to ring and them ignoring me, ignoring my emails. Um, I decided I had to find a different way of doing it. So I found this man called Chris Malchas, who was a warder at Polsmore Prison for 40 years and just retired and was now a sort of consultant. And he knew the system intimately. He knew what happened in prisons. He knew about gangs. And he was still very networked through pop crew, you know, the, the, the trade union or prison officials. And he was just amazing. He cut through all the red tape. He arranged a meeting. He, um, he you know, first he profiled Cecil Thomas for me so that I knew exactly what to expect. And then he came, he and my husband, Alan Hirsch, came with me to the actual meeting. And I believe you also met his family. Would you mind sharing that moment as well? Yes. Well, the first thing I did in, a, in an attempt to just find out, you know, how to get hold of him, because there's no system, there's no way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I went back to the court record and there was um, contact details there for one of the member of his family who had given evidence. Mm -hmm. So I just phoned her up. It was still, you know, and, and, and she was, you know, I just thought, She'll probably blank me, you know, because the whole thing was so traumatic, obviously, for his family as well. Anyway, she agreed to meet me, and um, she was, um, I mean, I thought she was wonderful, actually, under the circumstances. The first thing she said to me was, how is your family doing? And this kind of simple, humane empathy, I thought, was wonderful. She wasn't thinking about protecting herself or whatever. She was, she was just concerned about us. Um, and that for me was a very healing moment. So she said she put me in touch with other members of the family, but that didn't happen. So but that was fine because she also it was from her that I found out what prison he was in. So I was able to take the next steps to going to meet with him. In the book, you said coming to terms with the, your father's death was not easy because of the way he was killed. Would you mind sharing that a bit with us? My mother had died the year before of Alzheimer's. And they had a very long and close marriage. So we'd spent a year, you know, quite an intense year, several years, first help, you know, seeing my mum dying and help, trying to support him through that. And then in the year afterwards, trying to help him come to terms with being alone for the first time in, you know, 55 years. So it had been, you know, it would all been very intense. And finally, he um, seemed to be sort of settling into a new life. He just bought this house and moved to Tilbach and he just had it renovated. Mm. And um, he was sort of just, I think, coming to terms for the first time. So my mum, we buried her ashes in Cape Town, um, in Anglican Church, and then we'd had lunch. And then he drove back to Tilbach, the whole family. And we were a big family, so there were like 20 of us at the lunch, all immediate family. And then, you know, the following night, we heard that he'd been murdered. So um, something like that is utterly, utterly devastating. Because firstly, when our family you sort of responded in different ways, some of us felt guilt because we hadn't protected him properly. You know, we felt that we should have done more to make sure he was safe. And this wasn't rational because, in fact, he had everything. He had an alarm. You know, he, he, his, the face of the house was secure. Um, and... Just, it just the shock is just so profound that I, and it, it's a bit difficult to explain um, just you know, what it does to your very core. Um, but also the murder was brutal. You know, they didn't just kill him. 
they tortured him for an hour. To, uh, we, we assume it was in order to get the combination to the safe. Um, so, you know, it was a terrible, terrible death. Um, and that is just, you know, that is just, yeah, terribly difficult to come to terms with. Crime is, is on another level in our country because it, when I read the book, I got a sense that he lived in a fairly safer neighborhood, if I can say so. And uh, looking at the, the police uh, that was also at, in court to testify that he usually patrolled the area. So these things do happen in our country and it's so unfortunate. Yes, exactly. You know, you think you've made yourself safe. He thinks he's living in a safe village where there's a good police station. And as you say, this constable, it was very moving to me. You know, he knew what my father's habits were. You know, he knew that he, he went to bed late at night and he got up late in the morning. So he was very surprised to find the lights on when he did the morning patrol um, because normally my father slept late. So there was this care, you know, it was, it was, but nevertheless, you know, you're still not safe. But, you know, what we put together, Chris Malhas and, you know, other people working on it, was what seemed to have happened was my, my father had had workmen in um, to, to renovate the place. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them came from Sauron, which is um, a small town nearby, which was set up by um, German missionaries shortly after the slaves were given their freedom. So they harvested all these souls, as they call it, you know, people who were desperate for somewhere to stay and a way of making a living. And they, you know, in order to convert them to Christianity, but also gave them a place to live. So it's got the, it's had, it, had its roots in, in slavery, very much in our kind of, you know, dreadful past. Mm -hmm. And then um, Tilbach itself was said that, you know, her earthquake, um, I think it was 69, with the town was shattered and so was Sauron shattered. But the apartheid government then put huge amounts of money into restoring Tilbach, white Tilbach, in the image of its colonial Dutch past. Mm. Um, but Sauron was left with no, with, was given no help whatsoever, even though they suffered just as badly. Um, and what's worse, they took away their free water to put it into a dam. Mm. So, I mean, Sauron, all these things are part of our dreadful past, as useless things are uncovered. And then Cecil Thomas, who came from Sauron, um, was then working in Belleville. And what we think happened was that he became a drug addict, took addict, and he used to go and smoke took in this place called uh, Pelopos, which is like a sort of, you know, like the opium den used to be, used to be in um, China, mm -hmm. um, where you smoke and smoke and, you know, you build up the credit. And he built up his debt, and they said to him, how are you going to pay? So as we wrap up this interview, if you can share with us how you remember your father. You know, I remember him as a very kind of, uh, first of all, a very loving, involved family man. You know, he was deeply involved with all of our lives. We were all in constant contact with him. You know, it was a close, close family. Um, and also that he achieved an awful lot in his life. He, he did sort of change the perceptions of, of the economy and the apartheid era. So, you know, he made a contribution to, I think, to, to our political life. And in fact, the judge called him an activist for the poor, which I thought was, which was quite nice. Um, and he was always very, very, throughout his life, he then went on to the uh, Competitions Commission and he always fought against any sort of concentration of, of capital because he was so convinced that this was this was bad for well for all consumers but particularly for poor people because prices could be set up whatever they wanted to set them at. It's a dreadful loss and a very shocking loss and it changed all our lives, mm -hmm. his murder. And were there life lessons that you you could share with us? Yeah, you know my father was someone who always moved forward. He was always looking forward to tomorrow and he was always positive. Mm. So he was a man who was kind of, you know, very up and down, but it was usually always the up that won. And, and he was always very um, excited about things, you know, and always enthusiastic, you know, and always so interested in what we were doing. So I just mm. think this thing of being very engaged with life and engaged in a very passionate way. 
and always prepare to change his life at the last minute, you know, always do, do something new. It's a kind of courage to it. And I hope I've learned that wow. from him. There was Liz McGregor in conversation with Polity to discuss her book titled Unforgiven, Face to Face with My Father's Killer.